Amen. How are we all doing this evening? I like it. Summer's right around the corner. Another beautiful evening, right? Wednesday night service, hump day, right? Get through the week, middle of the week. It's always a blessing, man, that we get to gather before the Lord, see what he has in store for us. This evening, we're going to be in uh, James chapter 1. So why don't you guys turn with me in your Bibles there if you have them, and uh, see what God has in store for us this evening. Amen. Friday nights or Wednesday nights, now that we've kind of switched it up a little bit, it's always been one of my favorite nights, one of my favorite evenings to be able to gather. Uh, just something special about it. You know, um, one of the things about Fridays specifically, right, when we did it then, was just that remembrance, that we're being reminded of what we spent a lot of Fridays doing in the past, right? And uh, running around and, and doing the things that we used to do on a Friday evening, you know, but then be able to come to church and be able to serve God instead of that, right? Uh, doesn't really change, you know what I mean? It's not, not a big difference, whether it's Friday or Wednesday. The reality is the same, that whatever day it is and whatever we used to do, we get the opportunity now to do something different, you know, whether it's Friday, whether it's Wednesday or whatever the case. But, you know, sometimes we get, we get, caught, up in the, uh, we get caught up in the rut. Wednesday we go to church, Sunday we go to church, you know, we find ourselves in those places, you know, where we continue to go through these things, through these trials, through these, these com, com, uh, um, repeated things that we go through in life, and then it just becomes second nature, you know, to us, if you will. But the reality is, The reality is that every time we gather together, right, regardless where it is, every time that we gather together and we're looking at God's word, we get to hear from him, we should be in anticipation of an experience that we're going to have, right? If nothing else, you know that every time that you open up your Bible and you look at God's word, that he is going to speak to you, right? You anticipate that, right? And every evening, every morning, whenever it is that you open up your Bible, we are in, in anticipation that God is going to speak to us and nothing has changed depending on the day or whatever the evening is or morning is or afternoon or whatever the case is. But we open up the Word of God. This is the, the powerful, living, breathing Word of God. Amen. Amen? And do we have that mentality or that heart that says, you know what, I know the God of this universe, Right? who holds the universe in the span of his hand. I know that he's going to speak to me in this moment. And we are in anticipation that we know and understand that God is going to speak to us. We have to have that heart. We have to have that mindset. So that when we go to church or when we open our Bibles, then we're ready and excited. You know what I mean? It's like, man, I want God to speak to me. I want God to speak to me. I, I, I'm praying about whatever it is you're praying about. We got some graduates some guys that have been here for a lot of years, or for at least a year, I've been in the ministry almost 17 years, you know, and, and, and it's never changing, right, in the sense that we always want to be moved by the Spirit, at least we should be, and then we always want God to speak to us on a regular basis. But how do you know that God is speaking to you? How do you know it's not you? How do you know that that's exactly what God is telling you to do? How do you know that it's him speaking to you when you're praying about something or you're praying with a brother or a sister or whatever the case is? How do you know that that's God and not you? Because we're good at trying to figure out what our own will is, right? Maybe, maybe your overseer or one of your pastors comes to you and tells you, hey, well, if you want to do this, pray about it and, and show me in the scriptures confirmation where God spoke to you. So you're going through the scriptures, right? Trying to find something. You know what I mean? Right? Trying to find something that's going to pertain to what it is that you're praying about because you want to be able to get your way and what you want to do. So you find the scripture. You see right here, look at the Lord says to go to this place, you know. 
or to leave this place or to do this, right? And it's always, not always, I shouldn't say that. A lot of times, it's what we want. But, but God is not a God of confusion, right? God is a God of order. And we shouldn't be confused about what God does or what God wants to do. The question is, are we seeking enough? The Word tells us, right? Seek and you shall find. Ask and it will be given to you, right? Knock and the door will be open. But, are we, but are, we, are we those people that are seeking, that are asking, that are knocking in such a way that we're anticipating an answer? Now, you're going to get one of three answers, right? Usually the case Yes, no, or wait. Right? And we can deal with two of them, but it's the wait that sometimes we have a difficulty with. And I know in a room this size and this many people that we've got multiple people in this room praying for multiple things. Right? Asking God, God, what do you want for me? Maybe you've been in the ministry a long time and you're wondering if God wants you to go. Maybe you just got here and you still want to go. Whatever the case is. I'm telling you this evening that God has an answer for you. But are you anticipating him speaking to you? And then the other side of that, right, is, is once you do get the answer, here's, here's the hardest part. Maybe you got the answer already. The hardest part is being obedient to what he's telling you. You know what I mean? Because we might pray and pray and pray, God, give me an answer. God, give me an answer. Lord, tell me what you want me to do. And he says, okay, I want you to stay. And you're like, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden it's, you know, maybe that's not from the Lord, you know? So it's one thing to get an answer from God. It's one thing to have God speak to you. The other side of that is, Lord, help me to be obedient to exactly what you're telling me. Amen. Once I get to that place where I know that you're speaking to me, and I know that you're telling me whatever it is, then help me to be obedient to exactly what I know you're telling me to do. And if we live our way by that, because here's the thing. None of you are here by accident, right? None of you are in this place right now. There's a million places, I say this all the time, there's a million other places that we could be right now, but you're right here right now, Wednesday night, not by accident. 100% you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. God has brought you here right? 100%. Okay? And, and here's the thing. Not only are you here, whether you're in the ministry or you're not in the ministry, somebody has prayed you to the place that you're at right now. 100%. Whether it's your mom, your grandma, your dad, your grandpa, your cousin, your uncle, whoever the case is, right? Somebody prayed you to where you're at right now. So then you know for a fact that God brought you to this place. There's no doubt in your mind about it. You know that the Spirit of God moved powerfully in your life to bring you to this place. And until it moves that powerfully to tell you, take you out of it, then you don't move. That's how you know. And you wait patiently until God does tell you that. Because, man, it's a blink. It's a blink of an eye. And the grand scheme of eternity, man, it's a blink. Sometimes it's hard, though, when we find ourselves going through various trials, temptations, struggles. It's hard to stay faithful. It's hard to be faithful. We're going to look at James, one of my favorite books in the Bible. Just James and his heart and who he was and and his heart towards this very thing, having that faith. You know, being able to en endure these things, but not just to do it, but to have enough faith to do it. You know, coming to that place where you're saying, you know what, I don't know about you, but I remember when I first came to the ministry, man, I got on my, my knees before the crosses before God, and I said, man, if you're real, I'll serve you the rest of my life. When you got to that place in your life where you were where you were so done, you couldn't do it anymore. I don't know about you, but I had this weight on my shoulders that was just pressing down on me. And I felt like, man, everywhere I turned, everywhere I looked, I was running, 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 running. I was tired, tired of running, tired of carrying that weight and that pressure that you finally came to that place where you said, you know what, I'm done. And you just give up. That you had enough faith 
to say, you know what, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I know who holds my future, and I'm going to give up and say, God, I'm done. I'm tired of it. And you came to that place in your life. The problem is when we start to get our mind back, we start to get a little healthy, right? We start to get a little strong. The problem is that we start to be distracted. And we get distracted from what God wants to do in our life. We get distracted by our own selfish desires. Maybe we get distracted by trials. Maybe we're distracted by temptations. Nonetheless, if you're distracted by something, then the chances are you're not looking up where we need to be looking. Right? We're looking to the left and to the right. Someone's starting to bother you more. The world's starting to bother you more. The things around you are starting to bother you. You're bothering yourself more. Right? Because we're distracted. So our heart's not in it. We've got to come back. James chapter 1, verse 1. The word says, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Greetings from James starting off his letter, kind of a, a, just mentioning who he is, giving a little background, if you will, and then who he's writing his letter to. James, several men named James in the Bible mentioned in the New Testament. But a reliable tradition assigns the book to the one called James the Just. He was the half-brother of Jesus, right? We see that in Matthew. He was a brother of Jude. We see that in Jude 1. He speaks to that. And he led the church in Jerusalem for a period. We see that in Acts chapter 15. This is the James that we're speaking about, right? Early Christian history, the writings from Hegesippus, right? If you're, if you're into that, you can look into his writings and you can see that church history would tell us that James was a man of prayer. Not only was James a man of prayer, but he was such a man of prayer that, 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 that history tells us that he had these large, thick calluses on his knees, like, like that of a, of a camel. You ever seen a camel's knees? Calloused and stuff, man. That's what they, they would say um, in these writings of, of Hegesippus, that his knees looked at it like that. It also says that James was martyred in Jerusalem and he was pushed from a high point of the temple. Yet the fall didn't kill him. And on the ground he was beaten to death as he prayed for his attackers. This is James that we speak of. James identifies himself as a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was me and I was Jesus' brother, I might, I might have started off by saying that, right? James, Jesus' brother. Like, hey, man, I'm Jesus' brother. This is who I am, right? And I'm writing my letter. But no, he starts his letter off, doesn't even mention those things, right? He mentions that fact that he's a bond servant, a doulos is what the word tells us in the Greek, which means a slave or a, or a, a, a servant, or in other words, somebody who was given to servitude and who had, had, had been given his life to the service of his master, a doulos. A lot of times what they would do is they would take their ears and they would, and they would nail their, a, a hole in their ear and put an earring on their ear to the, to the door of, of, of the master, whoever slave master was, and that was a signification because the, the, the slave might have been let free. And he had the ability to go and to be on his own, but he's saying, you know what? I don't want to go. I want to stay here, and I want to freely give my life to your service. I want to be your bond servant. And they would do that. They would pin his ear to the door and put an earring on it, and it would signify that this man was freely staying to serve his master after his service was done. A bond servant. So it, it, with that type of, of, of uh, picture in mind, James would be a bondservant of Jesus Christ, right? Who would say that, Jesus, I've, I, I've pinned my ear to your door to service to you, and I vow to serve you the rest of my life. If you're a servant, your life is not your own. You don't get a choice. You don't get a say about what you do and where you go and how you live. You are under the guide and care of your master, and you go about and do about whatever your master says. Your life is not your own. 
It's been paid for at a price, and it's been bought in, and somebody owns you, if you will. See, that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make in life, is that we go about our life thinking that it's ours, and that we have a choice, or, or, or we have a say in the matter of what we do. We don't. If you call yourself a Christian, then your life is not yours. You don't get a say on what you do. The Bible tells you, and Jesus Christ tells you what he's called you to do and how he's called you to live. The problem is we walk around about our lives and say, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to go there. No, I don't want to stick and work at this place or whatever the case is when we don't have a choice. It's not about us. If you call yourself a Christian. Because you're saying what? I'm a little Christ. I'm a bond servant of Jesus. My life has been given. Then, then, then if my life has been given because it's been paid for and the punishment of death or the punishment of sin, which is death, has been paid for, somebody paid the price of what I deserved because I couldn't afford it and took my place, then who am I to say what I'm going to do and not going to do? Who am I to say that I have a choice? It's not a choice. You know, I wake up every morning and I go to work. And I don't sit in bed and think to myself, man, should I go today? No, nah, I don't think I'm going to go today. It's not a choice. It's not an option for me. It's either go to work or not pay the bills. Not pay the mortgage. It's not an option. The same thing is, 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 could be said in, in, in being a Christian. It's not an option. When you give yourself an option, that means you've had a choice. You've got a choice. We don't. And that's the biggest problem. When there's another way, most of the time we'll figure out how to, figure, how to go to that way. Bond servant. Slave. Permanent relation of servitude to another. In this case, to Jesus. A bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an important word, the word Lord, right? It's not just the word Lord, it's Lord Jesus Christ. And the word Lord, it translates in the ancient Greek to kurios. And it means that James considered Jesus God. He knew who Jesus was. He considered him God himself. And he's speaking to the 12, to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. At this time, the Jewish people were scattered all over the world. They were Christian communities among the, among the Jews and the Jewish communities throughout the world. And here is who James is writing his letter to. And he says, greetings. Customary greeting uh, for the Greek when opening a letter. Paul used it. James used it here. And uh, basically with that idea in mind, right? Salutations, greetings. Verse 2. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials... Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James regards trials as inevitable, right? This is something that we are going to have in our lives. This is something that if you are a believer in Christ and you have given your life to Christ, this is something that we are going to go through. Every one of us is going to go through some type of trial, right? The Word speaks about it. Jesus proclaimed it. And it is something that if you walked with the Lord long enough that in your life, then you know that you're gonna ha it's going to happen, right? It's a fact. It's not if, right? He doesn't say if. He says, my brethren, count it all joys when, Right? Count it all joy when, because you are going to face trials in your life. Some are self-induced and some just happen. But it's inevitable. And he, says, and he says when again and not if you fall in the, And at the same time, trials are occasions, believe it or not, for joy. We have an opportunity in the midst of the trials, 
In the midst of what we go through and what is taking place in our lives, whether it's physical, spiritual, financial, health-wise, whatever the case is, whatever trial we find ourselves in, you have and I have an opportunity to show and to have joy through it. It's an opportunity. Every single one of them. We have an occasion for joy. We can count it all joy in the midst of the trials because when we do that very thing, these trials are used to produce patience in our lives. It's like, if I go through this trial, if I have joy in this trial, then I'm going to start producing these attributes in my life. I'm going to start showing exactly what it is that God is doing in my life. I'm going to start exemplifying these attributes that God calls me to have as I go through these things. That's one of the blessings of it. We get to prove, right? We get to prove out what the, the, the things that God is doing in our lives. It's a privilege, but it's all perspective, and we have to look at it in such a way. We have to change the way we see things. We have to change the way we see trials. We have to change our perspective and see them for what they are. God allows these things to take place in our lives because he wants to build you, right? He wants to develop you. You know the old saying, right, how diamonds are made, right? Diamonds are made through constant pressure, right? And a beautiful thing comes out. One of the things that I always liked, you know, I was uh, talking to uh, uh, one of the guys that I work, one of my journeymen this morning uh, on the way to work. Uh, we're driving to USC, and, and we're talking about fires. I don't know how it got brought up, but uh, somehow fires got brought up, and, uh, and we're talking about them. And... Uh, when I lived up north, man, there was, a, there was a king fire where we lived, and it burned some 100,000 acres or something crazy, right? And uh, I thought, man, what a, what a devastating thing, you know? Here you have this beautiful El Dorado National Forest, 300,000 acres of just beautiful uh, uh, pine trees and, and, and just, I mean, a beautiful forest. And, uh, and, and 300,000, a third of the forest is wiped out, gone. Completely. But as I was talking to uh, one of the firefighters up there and one of the, one of the forestry people, um, because they, they fought this thing for months, and the whole town was, was just in, engulfed in people. They stayed in one of the parking lots of the grocery stores. They had the trucks, and I mean, hundreds and hundreds from all over the world, all over the country, excuse me, came down to fight it. But one of the blessings is, if you've ever been in that kind of area and you've ever seen a fire take place, right, in these areas, you know within a few years, life starts to grow. And it's a beautiful cycle. But the guy was telling me that some trees, a, a type of pine tree, cannot reproduce unless the pine cone is introduced to extreme heat. And what happens is when that pine cone is introduced to extreme heat, it cracks open. And when it cracks open, the seeds are able to come out and they grow new trees. And so it's necessary in that forest to have it burned, whether it's natural or unnatural. This one was unnatural. Actually, some guy started it. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's what happens. But nonetheless, what happens is because of that, being tried by that fire, if you will, life was able to grow. And I think the same, and you know, and then in that moment as I'm talking to this guy and he's telling me the stories in that moment, I'm liking it to, spir to, to a spiritual reality in our lives. And I liken it to the fact that, you know what, sometimes we have to go through extreme heat and fire for us to finally realize that we can have life. But you'll never see that when you're living in this comfortable life or you're living in the same routine and the same rut that you continue to do every single day over and over and over. And, and guess what? We're creatures of habit and we get very good at it, right? Very good at it. But sometimes God allows these things because he needs to introduce extreme heat to your life, pressure to your life, trials to your life so that you can grow and you can be the man or woman that God wants you to be. Because chances are we'll never do it. You know, you look at the Tower of Babel when God told them to go out there and to spread, 
And they all grew and they built these communities and they, they, they hunkered down right there where they were. And then they tried to build a tower to the heavens. And, and, and God said, okay, now you know what? Now I'm going to cause all kinds of confusion, change all your languages, and then you're going to be forced to go through it. All throughout the scriptures, you see it. Constantly. Trials taking place. The children of Israel going through difficulties and that would force them through that difficulty to finally move. Because they would get comfortable and they would set up shop. And God said, okay, boom, I'm going to let this happen. Okay, I'm going to let this happen. And it forced them throughout scriptures constantly to, to then, through that trial, to grow. And to travel. And to move. And to spread. And a lot of times, that's, what ne that's what's necessary for us. And the word says that. Through these trials, there are occasions for joy, and it produces patience. Patience in here, in this, in this word here, it's the Greek word hup, uh, hupomoni. And this word, and what it describes, and what it means, is not a passive waiting, not having patience when you're sitting at the doctor's office waiting for the doctor to see you. It's not a passive waiting, but it's an active endurance that helps you finish a marathon. That's what he's speaking about. That's the patience that he's saying. You need to have patience, but it's an active patience and it's an endurance to continue to run the race that God has set before you. The word hupomone comes from the word hupo, which means under, and the word mino, which means to stay or to abide or to remain. So in other words, it means to remain under and it has the picture of this right it has the picture of someone who's got this great weight right under them this heavy load staying there instead of trying to escape staying under this heavy load and carrying it upon their shoulders and not being actively uh, 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 ready to run and to escape this load but holding that weight upon their shoulders i always think of the atlas Right, when the, the man, he's sitting there holding that atlas on his shoulders, right, you know? But that's the idea, to remain under, right? Or to suffer patiently. Not that we would try to make the great escape, not that we would try to run from the situation, but that we would actively look in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that situation, that we would actively look for how God wants to teach us, train us, change us, mold us, and mend us into the believers that he's called us to be. God, how can you use this situation? How can you use this moment right now in which I am going through to make me a better person? How can I grow and learn from this very situation instead of, God, take this thing away? Because when we pray that prayer, believe it or not, when we pray that prayer, whether or not God's going to answer you or not, the reality is you're robbing yourself. And you're robbing yourself from what God not only wants to do in your life, but potentially can do in your life. And now you're taking away the attributes, the characteristics that God wants to have in your life, you're robbing yourself and you're taking them away from an opportunity for you to grow and to be better. Because James tells us what? He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Faith is tested through trials. It's not produced by trials. You understand? Let me say that again. Faith is tested through trials. Faith is not produced by trials. When you go through trials, it does not produce faith in your life. You already have to have this faith, right? And as you have this faith, it is proven that you have faith through the trial. You understand? That's how it happens. But how do you know you have faith if you've never been through anything in your life? You've never been through trials or temptations. You've never been through difficulties in your life. How do you know you have faith when you say you have faith if you have faith? The reality is it only comes through this. 
Faith is tested through trials, not produced by trials. Trials reveal what faith we do have, not because God doesn't know how much faith we have, but to make our faith evident to ourselves and to those around us. Because then the people around you look at you and they say, wow, you should have quit a long time ago. You should have gave up a long time ago. I remember you. You're the last person I ever thought would have changed. Right? You're the last person that I ever thought would have come to Jesus. And your testimony, your life, because your family and your people around you, your neighborhood, they know you. And when they see your change, that, in, that right there in itself, when they see what's being produced in your life and the people around you see it, there's no doubt about it that there's a God in heaven. 100%. Because it's nothing that we could do, nothing that I could do. That right there is evidence of faith. Not only in those around you, but in your life. We have to make our faith evident to those. And as James tells us, and we see that the testing of faith is what produces patience and so forth, and that trials, right, testing through trials not produced by trials, then how do we establish faith? Well, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Because Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us that very thing. The word says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is built in us as we hear and understand and trust in God's Word. And this is the importance of reading your Bible. This is the, the importance of falling in love with the Word of God, falling in love with His Holy Gospel, the Word of, of Jesus Christ, the Bible. This is how you build and establish this faith Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Trials don't produce faith, but when trials are received with faith, it produces patience. But patience is not inevitably produced in the times of trials. You see, here's what happens when Trials and difficulties are received in unbelief and grumbling and complaining. You know what it produces? Bitterness and discouragement. That's because we don't have faith. We're not trusting what God is doing in our lives. And don't get me wrong, it's, hard, it's, it's easy to do. Because we don't see the big picture. We see right here. We see the here and now. God sees the future, right? He sees what's going to take place 50, 60 feet, 100 feet, 100 days, 100 years down the road. He knows what's going to happen. He sees the outcome. He's watched the movie, and he knows that it ends in a good, in a good story. We only see it right here. We see the here and now, and so the difficulty is it's not fun, Right? It's not naturally joyful for us when we're in the midst of it, and it's difficult, and it's hard, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you it's easy, because it's not. But what I will tell you is that it's worth it, Amen. 100%, if we can endure and we can fight. Too many people, man, too many people quit and give up before they ever get to see the results. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest travesty, man, is how many people quit, how many people give up before you could even see the end result of what God wants to do. Now, it'd be easy, right? It'd be easy if God told you how the story ends. And, and technically, he already has. And that's the hope that we have within us, that one day we will be sitting in heaven. The Bible says, out of body, present with the Lord. The second we take our last breath, we get to be with Jesus Christ. And I know that this is not my, this is not my, 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 uh, my home. 
right? This is a temporary place that I'm passing through and that one day I will spend eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. That is the ultimate end of the story, Amen. right? That's the happy ending. But what I'm talking about is you're here and now and the life that you're going through now, you might not see five, ten years down the road or what's going to take place. And if you give up now, you'll never know. The word tells us that it produces patience. James exhorts us, right? And again, uh, uh, again, a reminder of if we don't have faith and we find ourselves in difficulty and we, see, we receive it in unbelief, that's when you find yourself grumbling, complaining, bitterness, discouragement takes place. But James exhorts us to count it all joy. Counting it all joy is faith, faith's response to a time of trial. Now that's ultimate, Right? That we would ever get, be able to get to that place. That you find yourself in the midst of the trial. And you're saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to, to, to go through this trial, to find, to, for finding me worthy to be able to go through this trial for your name, for you. You know, that, I mean, that's the ultimate. Count it all joy. Faith response to a time of trial. James is asking his readers to enjoy their trials. He did not say that they must feel full of joy or all joy or that trials are, 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 are joyful. No, he doesn't tell us that. Because the outcome is this, and James understands that. He says, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete, excuse me, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, here's the heart. The work of patience and endurance comes slowly and must be allowed to have its full bloom, if you will. Patient endurance is a mark of the person who is perfect and complete and lacking nothing. And what is he talking about? He's talking about a perfect faith. That's what he's talking about. That you can come to that place in your life where you have a perfect faith and understanding that going through whatever this is, going through this trial or this temptation or this difficulty, you have such a, a perfect faith that you're complete, lacking nothing in the sense that you know that you going through this is going to produce this uh, uh, characteristic, this patience in your life. And that you going through this is going to produce this, that you might be complete or have complete faith throughout this trial or these difficulties in your life. What a perfect place to be. Not impossible. It's not impossible. Patient endurance. To have that perfect faith. He goes on in verse 5 and he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven, tossed, uh, driven and tossed by the wind. For let that, uh, excuse me, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This was one of my favorites, man, to, to give out to some of the guys, you know. Uh, when they be all over the place. Double-minded, tossed to and fro by the wind, man. Sometimes we find ourselves, and you know, I always get that picture, right? You, you ever watch Gilligan's Island and, 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 and uh, the boat's tossing around, right? I don't know the song. I was trying to sing the jingle a little bit in my head, but I can't remember how it goes. Uh, or maybe you've been on a ship, man, when it's in the middle of a storm, you know? Um, and you see that wave. That, that, that boat has no, it has no control. Over, over how it's being tossed in that ocean. That ocean, it's, it's at the mercy of the ocean. It's at the mercy of the waves. Right? 
And that's a man without who lacks wisdom, right? Trials are necessary. They're a necessary season to seek wisdom from God. What better time and opportunity do we have in the midst of our trial to be able to go and say, God, I lack wisdom. I have no idea what you're doing right now in this situation. I have no clue. If you lack wisdom, great. Ask, right? Ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach. It's necessary and the season to seek wisdom from God. And we often didn't know we needed wisdom until we were in the midst of our trial. Right? We didn't know we needed this wisdom. The old saying, right, is, is knowledge is the accumulation of information. Right? You start to build knowledge, head knowledge. You start to learn about the, ro- the, about the Lord. You, re- you learn about his word. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. Wisdom is knowing what to do with it. Right? What do you do with that knowledge that you have it now? You got God's word. You got it in your head. You got a bunch of knowledge. You're puffed up with it, right? Or whatever the case is. What do you do with that wisdom? Or excuse me, that knowledge. Wisdom is what determines what you do with that knowledge that you have. And trials are a necessary season to seek wisdom from God. And again, many times we don't often know that we need this wisdom until we're in the midst of that trial. Once we are in that time of trial, we need to know that in, through that trial, in that particular trial, something that God wants us to be able to, to receive through faith is crying out to him to wisdom. And this requires wisdom to be able to seek him in the midst of that, to persevere by faith in the midst of that trial. In trials, we need a lot more, uh, we need wisdom a lot more than we need knowledge, right? We need to know what to do. We don't need a lot of information. We need to know how to respond to the information. We need to know what to do with the, in the midst of that situation with that information. Let him ask of God, the word says. To receive wisdom, we simply ask of God, who gives wisdom generously or liberally, without despising our request, right? God doesn't look at us and say, oh, man, I didn't know you were that dumb. You know, why are you asking for that? Right? He doesn't look at us that way. There's not a dumb question that we can ask. You know? He doesn't. We're ignorant. Let's face it. We don't know. A lot of us don't know. Maybe you're a babe in Christ. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord a lot of years. The reality is that we don't know because we don't ask. And if we don't ask, then how are we supposed to know? It's important. It's our job, right? It's our job. I'm learning. It doesn't matter how many times I've learned, I've read the scriptures or studied the scriptures. I'm learning something new all the time. The second that we come to the place that we think we know everything, that's a bad place to be. We don't. Nobody does. We're always in need of more information, more knowledge, more wisdom. Let him ask of God. It's that simple. You want wisdom? Ask God to give you that wisdom. And if you want wisdom, the place to begin is in the Bible. Pick up your word and start reading it. You want to know what God wants of you? You want to know the will of God in your life? You want to know what he's called you to? It's in the Bible. Every single thing that we have, right? It's in the Bible. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is found in the scriptures, the word says. Everything. You turn for Christ, Calvary Chapel, Roma Land, this church does not change you. The program does not change you. The word of God is what changes you. If you're not in your word, that's the problem. If you're not falling in love with that word, if you're not reading it every single day and falling in love with it, anticipating that God's going to speak to you and change you through it, it never will happen. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4.12, right, that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the vision of marrow and bone. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the word does. It cuts deep and it reveals our own selfishness. And it reminds us of where we're lacking. 
when the Word of God is powerful and it's sharper and it digs deep to the realities, right? We don't even know our own heart, the Word says. We're wicked and deceitful. Let Him ask generously. God doesn't despise your request. He wants you to have wisdom. He wants you to know. But let Him ask in faith, right? Again, we come to that place, right? The Word tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace, right? To come to Him with, again, that anticipation in faith that we know that God's going to answer us. It doesn't matter what the answer is, but we come to the Lord and we say, God, I know that you're going to answer me and you're going to give me this answer and I'm going to be obedient to whatever the answer is that you give me. But I have faith to know that when I cry out to you and I ask you for whatever this is, for wisdom in the midst of this trial or this season of my life, I know you're going to speak to me powerfully and I want, I want that wisdom and understanding to know what to do with it. But I'm anticipating you speaking to me in the midst of the situation because I have faith. We let our request be not doubting God's ability or his desire to give you his wisdom. This shows the kind of heart that we need in seeking God's wisdom from the scriptures, a heart that believes God's word and believes that it speaks to us today. And that's important. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe it? Because if you don't even know why you believe it, why am I going to believe it? Why do you believe what you believe? Because your parents told you about it? Because you're in a Christian ministry and they make you read the Bible all day long? Why do you believe it? Why is it real to you? Or is it real to you? Is it the living, breathing, powerful Word of God? Why do you believe in it? The Bible tells us to always give an account, always give an account for the hope that lies within us. Right? Why do you have that hope? And why do you believe in it? Ask yourself that question. Because if you don't even know the answer to that and you can't convince yourself, how are you going to convince him? He knows your heart. We ain't pulling the wool over his eyes. You're going through the motions, you're playing games, right? You're just here, you got 59, 59 sleeps, right? 59, uh, or 60, excuse me, 60 days, you know, to come to the program, or in your life, or your walk, or you, maybe you committed to six months, or a year, or whatever the case is, and you're just here, and you know the routine, you know the words. But do you really believe it? Is it real to you? Let that man, no doubting, let him ask in faith, heart that believes God's word, and let, that not, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything in the Lord, from the Lord. The one who doubts and lacks faith shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. The lack of faith and trust in God also shows that we have no foundation, being unstable in all of our ways. Somebody comes to you with this great idea. You know what I mean? Maybe one of the guys in the ministry wants to take off, and he's like, hey, man, I can get money. I can get a ride. You know, why don't you come with me over here, and why don't we do this, or one of the, one of the women, or whatever the case is. And then you're over there with your ear to them, you know, lending an ear to them, and all of a sudden you're all, you're all twisted up, ready to go take off and go do your thing. Why? Because you don't even know why you're here to begin with. Happens all the time. You know why? Because what's the old saying? Man, misery loves company. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to go, but I don't want to go by myself. You know what I mean? Why don't you come with me, man? I'll get you a job. We'll go to my mom's. We'll stay there. We'll make some money. I've heard all the stories, man. Next thing you know, you're both on the streets. Mom's is tripping, kicked you out. You got nowhere to go. If you don't have that faith... If you don't understand what God is calling to you, right, to do it without doubting, not let that man suppose that he's going to receive anything because he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. To ask God, but to ask him in a doubting way shows that we are double-minded. We have no faith. We should have never asked to begin with. You're asking for something that you don't even believe in to begin with. 
double-minded, unstable. If we had no unbelief, we would have no doubting. To be in the middle ground between faith and unbelief is to be, bu- be double-minded. It's not a bad place. The man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. In Mark chapter 9, he was not double-minded. He wanted to believe, and he declared his unbelief. God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand. His faith was weak, but he wasn't uh, a tinge with a double-minded doubt. We can come to that place. He said, Lord, give me that faith. I have no idea what's going on. I need wisdom. Help me to understand in the midst of this trial that I can produce patience that I can have faith, that I cannot doubt. And ultimately, that I can do it with a joy. That when the world looks into your life and looks around and sees you and everything says, man, you look at Job and you look at his life, man, and and, and, and God took everything from him. His family, his kids, all his friends were cursing him. Everything, right? Maybe you've been through a lot of things in your life. But that's not an excuse to be miserable. Maybe you were dealt a bad card, man. Your parents were jacked up, lived in a bad area. Whatever the case is, you were dealt a bad card, man. You know what, but here's the difference. You're grown now, and you have a choice. You want to continue living your life miserable, or you want to have joy in your life? There's no excuse for it. When you have belief, And you have a choice in your life to have faith and to trust that God is going to pull you through these trials and he's going to produce these things in your life. And what greater place to be than a place of joy with that wisdom knowing that, God, you're going to give me. And I believe that you're going to give me all the things that I need to have victory in this life with you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this evening. God, we thank you that we could look at the book of James and we can see his life, God, and just a little bit of a a testament to, God, what you want to do in it and what you did through it. Father, that we have the ability to look at the word and to see and allow it to just resonate within our lives. What it means to have faith. What you call us to in the midst of trials. And we would have joy, not only that we would have joy, but God, that we would count it joy that you've seen us faithful to allow us to go through these things, knowing that that in the midst of it and through it, you're going to produce these things in our lives. And we're going to come out better. But Lord, we know it's not easy. And so, Father, sometimes we lack wisdom. And I pray this evening, tonight, God, for every single person, myself including, in this room, that you would give us wisdom, Lord. Father, your word is clear and you declared it right now. We read it in the scriptures and we believe with faith. God, I believe with faith that you've told us to ask if we have a lack of wisdom. Lord, we lack wisdom. And we're asking this evening, God, give us wisdom. Help us to know that we know that we know what it is that you're doing in our lives. Help us to have joy through it. Help us to have faith. Lord, and may we be better because of it. May you help us to be stronger. And ultimately, Lord, may it cause us to trust in you more. That those around us ourselves included, would see our faith, right? As your word tells us, Lord, that that men would see our faith and our good works, God, and it would glorify you in heaven. Lord, help us to have that kind of heart. Bless your children, I pray. Bless this evening. Bless the worship, Lord, as we get into it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.